thank you for joining us. Thank you to those online as well. I'm Gloria Palmer, the Executive Director of Green Mountain Academy for Lifelong Learning. First of all, please silence your cell phones. And then during Q&A, we will have a microphone um, passed. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for the mic to come to you. And for those online, please type your questions in the chat box and Liz will monitor those. I'd like to thank the Manchester Community Library for welcoming us in this space. And thank you to GNAT TV for videotaping this program and running the live stream. I also like to point out that GNAT has been taping our lectures for years, and they have a diverse and robust library of our talks that you can access on our website by clicking the watch button. What's coming up on April 2nd, Tuesday, we have the second panel discussion in our Raising Resilient Children speaker series. The program is titled Building Blocks of Resilience, Nurturing Mental Wellness in Our Children. That will be held here at the Manchester Library at 5.30 on April 2nd. And then on Thursday, April 4th, we have Sean Harrington, who is the curator of the Manchester Historical Society. He's going to talk about old Manchester, Vermont maps. This will be an engaging evening looking at the old maps of Manchester from 1856 to 1869 and into the early 1900s. What can we learn about these maps? How do we read them? What records of history do they hold? How accurate were they? We will look at the changes in the landscape and streetscape where people lived, worked, and played. And this program is in collaboration with the Manchester Historical Society. That will be held here at 5.30 on Thursday, April 4th. Our guest speaker is the publisher of the Radford Free Press, a blog on economics covering contemporary issues and the state of economic theory. More broadly, he writes and consults on economics and business theory. He is a co-founder and serves on the executive committee of the World Economics Association. A frequent lecturer for GMAL, he also moderates the weekly roundtable discussion group and is president of the GMAL board. Please give a warm welcome to Peter Radford. Thank you. I'm surprised, I, let me get in front. I'm surprised so many people bothered to turn up. I keep hearing people saying we don't like this election. You know, so I expected nobody to turn up, kind of thing. All right, guys, we have a we have a we have a we have a lot to get through. Um, let me start immediately by this is kind of where I'm going to go. We're going to talk about the economy and all of these kinds of bits of the economy. So, because I think sometime during the election year, somebody may ask a question about one of these, and I think it'd be nice if you had sort of some information about it. Um, as we go through it, I'm going to try to point out one or two policy differences so that as we go through the year, you can kind of say, oh, okay, that's, I recognize that kind of a policy, or, and I kind of recognize the impact. So that's what I'm going to do there. Then I'm going to get to this. I, I have, I've done a Herculean effort. I want you all to recognize how much effort I put in. I've read hundreds of pages of documents that people are putting out. This is an election year. They all put out all this stuff. I read it, so you don't have to read it. I've tried to summarize it in a few pages. We'll get to it. Um, my early notion is that none of it will come to pass, but at least we should know what they're trying to do, okay? And then at the end, I got, I, I'm being sneaky. I've got a couple of charts at the end just to show you how difficult it is because we all sort of criticize everybody. Oh, they said it was going to grow by 3%, and now it's growing by 2%. Why is it? I'm going to show you how that happens at the end. Because I, I, I was getting really kind of, this was getting tedious for me when I was putting it together. So I thought I'd have some fun at the end. Okay, let's start with this. Um, this is drawn from the uh, IMF, as you can see. What I've done is I've taken their forecast data for 2019 through, 24, uh, through 23, and then... 24 and 25 are forecasts. Ec these are economies, the G7 economy, you've heard of the group of seven, G7 economies, Japan, Italy, France, Canada, and so forth. The United States is by far and away the best performing. 
One of the problems we've all got is, as you may hear the punditry all saying, that there's a disconnect between what's actually going on and what people think is going on. So throughout today, I'm going to try to hammer away at what's going on. I'll leave you to figure out why people may think. The United States, there are people in all of these other countries who would love to be in the United States. The, the economy is doing really, truly very well. Um, the second one, by the way, is uh, Canada. So that's if you go down that way. And the very bottom one is the UK. So my home nation is not doing too well. All right. So let's take a look. At th there's going to be a lot of charts like this, guys. So get used to it. We're, I'll try to, try to help you out as best I can. Um, the, the, I've divided, as you can see, Trump, Biden. We start in 17. We go through to 23. This is three years. That's four years. He's rain ended with that 4.2. So the problem we've got with interpreting what's going on in the economy is you've got this incredible seesaw thing in the middle that distorted absolutely everything. But I want to point out, when, when politicians are always saying, oh, I'm going to get GDP up to 3 4%. No, they're not. You look at these numbers, you can see that it's, that's a really, really hard thing to do. It's, it's, it's just not going to happen. This... If, you, I show, if I showed you this chart on an annual basis, this is called quarters, all right? This is per quarter. If I, if I showed you on an annual basis, this year, that, 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 and that would still be positive. And you would, also, you would all be looking at me saying, well, what happened to that pandem pandemic uh, uh, recession? Well, it's there. But the problem is we had this after it, so the year, there's no recession for the year. So what, can we draw a conclusion from here? Hang on. Well, I'll just, just get to this. We'll just do a little comparison. When Trump came into power, that was GDP. When he left, that was it. That's the increase. That's the annual change. Okay? Trump, Biden comes in with the same. This is it. This is it. This is it. So Biden has done better on an annualized basis. This is annualized on an annualized basis. It doesn't feel that way to a lot of people, but it's just the way it is. It's, he's doing well. Um, <laughs> the poor old Trump, hang on, let me go back. Just, Trump obviously was hurt by this. If I took that out, his number would be higher. So we just, we can, you know, you, you pay your money, takes your choice. It's the, 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 if you're comparing Trump and Biden, which I shouldn't really be doing because I don't believe that either of them have too much control over too much, but we'll get into that. All right, let me go here. One of the biggest factors in the success of the current economy is this. The United States economy is a consumption economy. Two-thirds to three-quarters of our economy is generated by people buying stuff. It's not investment in housing, it's not business investment, it's not trade, and it's not government spending. They're the four things in an economy, right? Government spending, trade, investment, and then consumption. Consumption, by far and away, is the biggest thing. If you look at this, here you go, toddling along at a nice rate, then the bottom falls out, then we start to come back. This is the stimulus that everyone's criticizing um, uh, uh, him for, Biden for. And then, as you can see, it starts to slope back after the stimulus, but at no point is it here lower than it was there. And that's why you've got that 2.1 and 2.7 difference, right? We are consuming, American consumers are out there buying stuff, despite the fact they're telling you how bad they feel. So it's, well, that's a contradiction. Normally speaking, if they come out and say, I'm not feeling too good, they don't go out and buy stuff. So it's like, okay, if you're not that confident, why are you doing it? So there's just too many of these psychological questions that we have to ask ourselves. <coughs> This is another interesting thing. Now, cons as a subset of consumption, one of the most important ones that we will watch is this thing called durable goods. Durable goods being things like refrigerators, microwaves, and so on, right? Things that cost you a lot to buy. Again, chugging along, this is going from 2000. This is the recession in the, the Great Recession in the middle, then a steady recovery, and then boom! All of a sudden, people are out there with their credit cards or with their, their cash from the, the pandemic and their stimulus checks, and they're buying like crazy big ticket items. Another sign, usually, 
that they're feeling really good about the economy, right? They usually, they only do this kind of stuff en masse. This we saw in France, we saw it in Italy, we saw it in Germany, we saw it in the UK, we saw it in the United, uh, here in the United States. The US is different, it hasn't gone down. All those other countries, this has dropped down, it would be down about here by now. But you can see it's leveling off. And as we go into this election year, it's this leveling off I'm going to keep reminding you of because the economy is doing one of these things. We're going to have to see if we actually stay out of recession as we go through the year. That's, but you can start seeing the impact here. We're, we're leveling off. Savings. I started back in 47 because I want everyone to have a good idea of what's going on, right? That... And I, look at it, it jumps all over the place. It jumps all over the place because of various recessions and bits and pieces along the way. That's why I put the trend line in. It, it, the United States, Americans don't save. <laughs> they spend, but they don't save, right? It's, 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 it's been a problem in particular since about here. Um, you can see the effect. This was kind of the end of the, uh, the Clinton era, the, the, the dot com, there was a lot of money floating around. People did save. We did start to, this is a percentage of disposable income, by the way. It's not just absolute. You did see a recovery, and then you had a recession, a bit of a recovery. The big recession, which wiped it all out, a bit of a recovery, and now we're here. And again, the importance is going into this year is that to what extent are savings, the lack of savings, going to slow down on those consumption numbers that I was telling you before. Because people either spend out of wages, savings, or debt, right? That's the three sources of, three, three sources of purchasing something. You either have cash, because you've got a wage, you've got cash in the bank, or you've got this. At the low end of the economy, it tends to be on credit. At the higher end of the economy, it tends to be out of savings. It just tends to be, not necessarily absolute. But so savings is, a pro savings is an issue. So as we go through 24, are, is there enough savings to keep that consumption level I was talking about a couple of minutes ago going, going further? It's just a, is it, the answer to that is nobody knows, but it's certainly something we're going to be watching. <laughs> this is, uh, now what I've done is to take the last two years, three years off that chart. So now we're signing in 16, and we're coming through the end of 20. This is actually the end of 23 to show you the impact of the pandemic because we have, again, low savings rate. This, again, it's the disposable income. Low savings rate, and then all of a sudden we had a big savings rate. Well, that's because people weren't spending in the pandemic. So, the, you know, they were getting income, but they, so it's artificial boost in savings, if you see what I'm saying. Right? That's unspent money. But this second one is money from the stimulus. So we had back-to-back sources of cash. People had, they felt good. They felt money in, the money in the bank. So that's why we had that burst in consumption, the burst in durable goods uh, spending that I, I spoke about. And that's why the American economy has really boomed in the last two of them. Not boomed. It's done well in the last two or three. A boom would be more than 3%. But it's done well. So, but you can see the, argue, the political argument that you may hear this year is, was this necessary if we had that? Right? If we, if we had that piled up and everyone knew we had that piled up, did we need to go and do that? That's the knock on Biden. Right? You may have heard people talking about we, the stimulus was too much or the stimulus created inflation and so on. The, it, it was the fact that he went and did this bit when this already existed, caused that discussion, right? And it may have caused, some people think, it may have caused inflation, because if you have high savings and high spending and there's not enough supply to meet that demand, you're going to get rising prices. So I'm just trying to highlight, as you go through and you think about the year, you may hear people talking about this, the stimulus. Debt, credit cards, Th this... Normal, normal, again, this is the two year, the, the, the Trump, Biden. You had here, you had the pandemic. People used a lot, pe people used a lot of the savings to pay down credit card debt. But you'll notice sometime towards the end of 21 or the latter part of 21, they started piling in back to credit cards. 
This now is at a, pretty much an all-time high. Okay, not necessarily if you adjust, uh, adjust it for inflation, but on a non-inflation adjusted, credit card debt outstanding in the American economy is now at a very, very high level. Now, there are two, like everything in economics, there's two ways of looking at that. You can say, people are feeling good, so I can go and buy because I know I'm going to pay it off. Or, people are feeling bad, I've got no income, I've got to use my credit card. Right? So, unfortunately, you pay your money and takes your choice. The, the, the going along with this incredible increase is an increase in defaults. As anybody who used to be in the banking industry, so I can, I can prattle on about the banking oh, you, you, well, Sorry, you, you know about this then. But the, as the defaults, as, the, as, as this thing, you would normally see the defaults rising, lagging this thing. Right? It's gonna, you know, people borrow and then a few months later they decide they can't pay back and you normally see. Defaults are in fact starting to rise. If that, coming to our, back to our election year, if this is true, then you're going to start seeing the economy slow because if people are defaulting, banks could get into trouble with their, with their loans, loan losses and so forth. But we could also, uh, it also implies a slower economy. Election year economy, we're talking about the election year economy. I'm trying to unpack what things that might affect it. This is definitely something that might affect it. But perhaps it won't. This is how much as a percent of, of disposable income uh, are interest payments in the average household. And it's come down, it's come way down. I've gone back further here because I wanted to capture the big change here as a result, as a result of the Great Recession. As a result of the Great Recession, American consumers paid off a lot of debt. Interest rates also came down. So here we've got a flat period and then we go through here. This is the, if you, if you remember that double peak I had of savings, this is the opposite side of it because people were paying off debt, right? Okay, so, but it's now crawled back and right at the end there, you can start to see it climbing up again. So in 2024, as we think about this year and as you think about the politics of this year, as you get further into this year, it's possible that that, continues to climb a little bit, and that also possibly starts to cramp down on consumption, slow the economy down, and therefore we could be looking at a much weaker economy later in the year. It's that right there that you should really focus on. Like this, the, the problem with all of this is that there's this uneasy feeling. It could, is it driven by confidence, I'm spending more, or lack of confidence, I'm being forced to spend on things I don't want to spend on? It's, unpacking it is a very hard thing to do. This is one of the most important charts in the whole presentation, so I'm going to spend a little time on it. Some of you have seen this before because it's one of my favorites. I always bring this out. <coughs> the red line, potential, potential GDP as calculated by the Congressional Budget Office. They're, supposed, they're the neutral scorekeepers, right? That red line tells us basically how much GDP, how much wealth each year we would be creating if everything was going according to plan, if the factories were busy, employment was high, low inflation, all of that kind of stuff, right? So, so that is your potential, right? You want to have your economy running as, Stan, please. You want to have your economy running as close to potential as possible. I started this back in 2000. The blue is actual. We've been leaving a lot of money on the table for a very long time. This is a this is substantial gap, a very substantial gap, and it accumulates to trillions of dollars, which we will never get back because it's lost, it's in the past. So we, we can't recapture that money. It's money we could have generated for ourselves but didn't because of economic policy, okay? So the bigger the gap between these two lines, the more critical we should be of economic policy. This was, this was Bush. We kind of crept back up. This was the Great Recession, and this is Obama. And then you get to Trump right here, and we finally nudge, and finally nudge. This line right here, this gap right here, is precisely why Biden did his stimulus. And you'll see the effect of it here. And we shot right back up to potential. So the point I'm trying to get to you is you can have a hands-off kind of policy, and you get that. 
or you can have a very active policy and you get that. The purpose, the purpose of the stimulus was to get us as close back to potential as quickly as possible. Because we learned that you're leaving money on the table right here. Right? We are leaving a lot of money. We should have, we, and there were people, like my, including myself, saying this stimulus should have been much, much more dramatic right here. Much more. It should have been like this. Because then we would have closed that and we would have been generating higher wages, higher profits, high, a lot of good stuff. But we didn't. We chose to go slow. And it, it made it worse because, if some of you remember, people started getting weak need in here about the size of the federal deficit. They started cutting the federal deficit by, well, some, you know, if, if those of you remember, Obama got into cutting the spending and, and so forth. That ac accentuated this problem. It slowed the recovery down. So we like to be, this blue line needs to be as close to that red line as possible. Every time you don't have it there, we're leaving money on the table. It's important in this election year to contrast that policy with that policy. Right? That's, that's the point I'm trying to make here. There are two ways of solving our problem when we have an issue. You can do this, or you can do that. This is by far and away preferable, even though we had an infl inflationary problem, a burst of inflation. We got back to our potential. We aren't leaving money on the table. So it's an important issue just to keep in the backs of your minds as we go through the 24 uh, election cycle. This will come up at some point. Right? The, 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 did, was the stimulus necessary? No, it was wasteful money. Well, and you'll hear all the usual stories about that kind of stuff. Right? But that's why this chart is, I dwell on this chart. Because precisely, you Bush, Obama, Trump, all leaving things relatively alone. Huge difference with Biden. So that's a major shift in policy in the United States that has that a lot of people don't even focus on too much. But that's why you do it, to get us back to that red line. Inflation is a lot on this chart. I was going to do several charts, but I thought I'd shove it all on one. <coughs> you can see, and again, this is starting in 2019. Going back this way, it's all like this. Blue line, CPI, that's the, that's the headline number that we all read about in the, in, the, in the newspapers. The red line is this arcane thing called the personal consumption expenditure to deflator. That's the thing that the Fed actually looks at. Uh, it, it, there are so many different ways of calculating inflation, it gets confusing. But this, these are the two biggest, CPI and uh, PCE. Then you've all heard about core CPI. That's, uh, you take... You, you take this number and you drop out a whole bunch of things that go up and down every month <coughs> or every two or three months. And it, it, if you're tracking inflation, you, those volatile things, the price of eggs, the price of gasoline, the price of this and that, that can go up and down like this through a year. So you take all that out because that's not a good trend and you look at, the, you look at this thing, okay? Now, the lesson here is everyone's reacting to that. The inflation number that the Fed's working for is a little lower but, that's, but it's still very high. This is, this is, if you go back, I'll show you in a minute, if you go back through time, this is quite a high number. And this is probably why a lot of people are still disgruntled, because core CPI includes things like rent and some large things that don't change frequently. So rents are typically repriced once a year. That's why this thing is not coming down yet. It will start to come down. But it, 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 there's a lag in it because a lot of things, this, your rent is replaced here. That drives this line up long after other things have gone, gone, gone up in, in price, right? That's why inflation is a difficult thing to unpack at the moment because you've got so much lagging in it. <coughs> and so, so the, the, the uh, policy reaction is set by this red line, but they're also looking at this because if it's still lagging, we can't take a foot off policy just yet. We can't, we can't drop interest rates just yet because we've got this thing out there. The dotted line is the interesting one from my point of view. That's the University of Michigan does a survey and asks people, what do you expect inflation to be? So that's, that's the, this dotted line is what consumers are telling you they expect inflation to be. At no point did it get up there. At no point, they, even, even at the height of this, people were saying, nah, Three, five, four percent, whatever, but much lower than the, 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 the peak numbers. Why is that important? 
Because you will read a lot in the press, especially this year, about people saying pricing, people are bidding in or they're building into their expectations inflation. That's going to drive up wages and I have to react. I'm Mr. Powell at the Fed. I have to react to that. These expectations. I need to scrunch expectations. That's why we raise interest rates. We try to create a bit of unemployment. We try to make people feel insecure. That way they don't bid up wages. Right? The whole purpose of raising interest rates is to make people unemployed. We're not supposed to say that, but that is true, right? So, so, right? so that's the whole purpose of monetary policy, right? So we drive up interest rates. You create a little bit of unemployment. That makes people insecure asking for a pay increase. And you keep this thing under control. But it never really got out of control. It's, that's the thing about this cycle. So again, it's like this weird thing as we go into the election year and you hear people talking. It's like people are upset about inflation, but you're really not that upset because you're not bidding it into your way. You're not going around asking for a 10% wage increase. You're, you know, maybe you're asking for a 4% wage increase because you think it's going up. But nobody's sitting there thinking we're in hyperinflation, despite what you may read or think when you read in the media. We're, this was a, a bout of inflation. We didn't suddenly move up into some pre-war Germany kind of thing. It's just, it, it, we've got to keep our heads up. Now, how does that relate to wages? Because obviously that's the other side. When people are, fi are fighting price increases, how does that... And you can see down here, back in 17, wages were above. Uh, the, this is the, the this is the blue line from the previous wave. This this right. So this is inflation. This right. This is the core inflation I just showed you on the the other chart. Inflation was below wages in in 19. That's one of the reasons why a lot of people look back on the Trump era as being a good one. It was one of the first times for a very long time where wages were running above inflation. So that's, that's something that we've all got to bear in mind. That's why people, when they look back through the pandemic, through inflation, they're trying to remember a good time. A lot of people are looking back at this and saying, oh, yes, I got a, I, you know, inflation was low and I was getting a pretty decent pay raise. So they look back and then look at what's happened ever since. It's, it's just this gyrations all over the place. It's chaos. I don't know what's going on. Another thing, I'm just trying to be as transparent here as possible. See this spike in wages? That's entirely a result of a lot of low-end people getting fired and driving up the average wage, right? And during the pandemic, so you read, you, so we, we get into the pandemic, oh, so, oh, wages are doing well. No, they're not. We've just fired a whole bunch of busboys who were earning nothing, and all, uh, all the Wall Street people are still employed. Their wages are still counted in this average number. So that goes shooting up. Ignore it. And then it we hire them again, and it comes clashing down. They also ignore that. Okay, <laughs> you, just, you just have to suspect, you have to dig into the numbers and figure out why did that speak, it went peak. It wasn't all of a sudden we had all this inflationary wage stuff. It's just we lost a lot of low-end workers and we brought them back. This, however, is wage increase. <laughs> this, this bit, we did start seeing wages go up during, uh, right after the pandemic. Why? Because unemployment was so low. What you've, you've heard it all around here. People, it's hard to hire people. That, generally speaking, is a good thing. <laughs> Businesses complain about it endlessly because they're going to have to pay to hire people and they don't like doing that, right? That's something that they don't like doing because then they pass it all along to you in prices. So there was normal, abnormal, crazy, and then this. But as you can see, wage increases have started to come down. But that's now running ahead of inflation, not core inflation, which is why I think people are still reacting negatively. But that thing's going to come down too, and this is going to continue like this through the years. So, so you've got a strange little story at the end too. You've got a strange story here. You've got a strange story here, which makes 2024, trying to sit down and say what's going to happen in 24, makes it really kind of complicated. <laughs> it's like unpacking which, which line do you think is going down fastest is, is the game we're playing, right? <clears throat> so inflation is an, uh, is an odd fish, but I think this here, but even though I'm getting a good pay increase, I still don't feel like I'm keeping up with inflation. I think that's got a lot to do with the, the psychology of, uh, coming into the election. I, I borrowed this. I'm shameless. I borrowed it from this guy. This period, 23 to 29, this is the low end of income 
getting into the middle, this is the top level incomes. If you're going up, you're doing well. If you're going down, you're not. This, is, this period is the first period in about 40 years when wage inequality has, has started to tighten up. People at the bottom end of the income scale are doing better percentage-wise than people at the top end of it. That's the only reason I put that in here. You would think that would in improve people's moods this year. You would think, but apparently not, right? This, this, it, it, it is precisely because we've got such low unemployment. It's precisely that. These guys can bid up their wages. These people are stuck on, on a salary cycle that is less easy to, to manipulate. But you would think that would lighten the mood? I don't think it is. This is the long view of inflation, and I apologize because I packed it in. 1948 to 23. This is another one of those moments when I want to try to tease out policy differences, right? This is our spike of inflation. The one that most of you are going to remember well is that. This is the 70s, the oil crisis, blah, blah, blah. And then right here we have, we have Volcker getting hired and we have right, the, the, the interest rates going through the roof. And that drives down inflation and gets us down here. And we've been pretty steady ever since. If you were here and you're a policy person looking at that, you were saying, oh, I've got to drive up interest rates because we've got too much demand in the economy. It's a demand side problem. It's wages creating too much spending power and people are out there trying to spend and there's just not enough stuff to buy. That's, the, that's, the, that's how you would look at that. So people like Larry Summers go on television and they, you know, they talk, oh, we're going to have to have unemployment of 8 9% and maybe for two, three years to drive this number down. Well, as I was just saying, it's already coming down. So he's obviously wrong. The reason he's wrong is because that's the wrong example. That's the right example. This inflation period was entirely different. That's coming out of World War II, then you have the Korean War. The American economy was a war, wartime economy, and it was adjusting back, matching supply and demand, and you had a lot of people coming out of the military and so on, getting jobs with money, but there was nothing to buy. There was a supply-side problem. That's precisely what we just went through. We had a supply side problem. Things weren't getting to the United States from China, let's say, because of the pandemic. Prices go up, right? Chips, obvious thing that you probably all remember, chips and so on like that. That created the inflation. It wasn't too much demand. This, if you use this as an example in your policy, you would never have driven interest rates up as high as we've just had. You would have said, yes, some, but not like we have. You wouldn't have been out on television making a complete fool of yourself saying we need 10% unemployment, otherwise this thing's never going to go away. Right? You wouldn't have done that if you had used the right example. So this is another point I'm trying to get at you. There are two radically different ways you can get the problem, two different solutions. We chose that solution. We should have chosen that solution. And I think, and I think it makes a lot of difference in this election year because we've got a residual high interest rate environment that we maybe didn't need. And I'm, I'm a, I'm a, I argue about that all the time. Not, not here, but I talk to people all the time. We did not need to raise interest rates the way we did. Because of that, we're not here. So just another, another, another way of looking at 2024 through a slightly different lens. OK, house prices. I'm putting this here because my wife and I bought our house right there, the very lowest reading on the Case-Shiller Index, uh, and we're very happy that inflation has boomed and our house has gone up in value tremendously. You don't, most people don't think of that as inflation. They think of it asset price appreciation. It's inflation, okay? You all love inflation. You love it a lot, right? Because of your know, house price. Oh, I'm, so, I'm, I'm a really good investor. I bought a house and it's gone up in value. I must be smart. It's called inflation, guys. I remember having a conversation right, right back there somewhere um, with a former uh, head of the Federal Reserve Board saying, why isn't this in the inflation number? If it was in the inflation number, we would have had a really regressive interest rate environment back here to squash Price, house prices, because this is a bad thing. 
A lot of people say, well, no, I can sell my house. It's a good thing. But it also means a lot of people can't buy a house because it's a bad thing. And we've now got a housing shortage in the country because people, we've priced a lot of people out of the market, but we've also not constructed the right homes. Right? That's another thing that's come into the election year. People are talking about home prices a lot this year. Right? It is on the, on the ticket, and, you're, and that's one of the reasons why younger voters have a very different attitude towards the economy than older voters. You're all sitting on this end. They're all sitting saying, when do I get in this, in this gravy train? So there's a, that's one of the reasons why reading the electorate this year is very hard to do, because depending on your age and prospects, if you're sitting and you can't get into this game, you have a slightly different attitude towards the marketplace. The other thing that is popping up a little bit, I read it a lot in the, in the material, is that nimbyism, you're all aware of that. No, rich people don't like having cheap houses in their towns, right? And the problem about that is rich people tend to dictate the politics. <laughs> They're the ones that talk a lot. They're the ones that go to meetings. They're the ones that write letters. They're the ones that do all of that stuff, right? And they don't want cheap housing. So we never build it. So now we've got, if you're trying to get on the bottom of this, there's no way to get on the bottom. So we've, we've changed the nature of our housing stock dramatically. We have too little housing, and it, a lot of it's in the wrong place. So that's why housing is going to be an issue. You'll hear it in the background a lot this year, and I think in politics, and it's certainly going to be an issue over the next two election cycles, I think. It's going to be, this will drive a lot of younger voters to pay attention to this. Consumer sentiment. I've got a lot of charts that seem to fall off the page like this. <laughs> Consumer sentiment. Yeah, dawdling a lot. This is 2016 through here. Da 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 da. Bonk. That's the pandemic. Then it starts to come back. This is the inflation. Right? This is this 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 consumer number. This is from the University of Michigan survey. Okay. Uh, they do it. I showed you a little bit about, the, they, they ask about inflation. They also ask about consumer sentiment. The interesting thing here, there's two, I, you, you've all, some of you have seen the chart I'm going to show next, which breaks it down with Republicans versus Democrats. But if you, the interesting thing here is that if you ask people, how are you doing? Oh, I'm doing okay. Well, how's the country doing? Well, it sucks. Right? And it's, it's a really, really huge separation now. It's like normally speaking, when I was doing these kinds of talks 30, 40 years ago, there would be a gap. People are always more optimistic and knowledgeable about their own circumstances than they are about the national circumstances. But right now, the gap's huge. It's a really astonishing thing. It's, and it's, it's right across most of these social questions. You can ask about crime. Well, there's no crime in my town. But boy! The murder rate across the country must be through the roof. I see it on TV all the time. The people are not making, they're not generalizing the same way that, as they used to. That's an issue in this election. Because if you're a policymaker trying to address something, you're, you're, how do you address something when people have a misconception of what's going on? Right? You can think you're doing the right thing, but they're not understanding why you're doing it. And they're not even seeing you doing it. So it's a very complicated and difficult political cycle. Oh, so, oh, sorry. I just got us out of that. Let me, let me get, let me. <laughs> I clicked the wrong button, guys. There we go. There we go. <clears throat> All right. I promised you I'd show it to you um, by show it to you by uh, party affiliation. This is a, the Trump era. Oh, guess what? Republicans think everything's going pretty well. Democrats not so much. Election. Oh. All of a sudden, the Democrats think everything's going well, and the bottom fell out for the poor Republicans. I feel bad for them. I mean, it's like, really, nothing changed that much, guys, but you feel bad, right? Um, and good old independents seem to be plumb in the middle on everything where you would see it. I, 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 I've been, I, I started doing talks like this in, what, 1980 or something like that. I have never had this. I've never, ever ever seen this, okay? I mean, I've never seen this subject so polarized. People are looking at the economy, not as an economy, but as a political exercise, right? It's like that. I'd never seen that before. And it makes, it, and I wouldn't want to be a policymaker. How can I, I can't satisfy these people. I can't do anything that's going to make them happy. Their wages could be going through the roof. Their house prices could be through the roof. They could be making profit, but they're not going to reward me. 
Right? It's a very odd circumstance. This is, a, uh, this, this is why 24 is such a difficult, difficult year to unpack. It's a difficult year to understand. And it's certainly difficult. To, how do you situate? If you're a policymaker, how do you even deal with this? Um, it's, it, I just thought it would be fun to show you that. Okay, this is my snake chart. <coughs> Interest rates. <coughs> Great recession right back in here. Right? We keep interest rates really, really low. Why did we keep interest rates really, really low? This is a trick question. Go back to that potential actual GDP gap. The Fed is trying to fill that gap by accelerating the economy when we should have used the government spending. But we didn't because we're all saying we can't do that anymore. They kept the interest rates artificially low to put their foot on the gas to try to drive the economy up. And we've created a lot of knock-on problems by having you know, overinflated health prices. This is, the, this is one of the examples as a consequence of this. Then you start to come out of it a little bit. We start to normalize. Trump was complaining about this a lot. Then we go back in, and then we have this. And as I said a few minutes ago, we may not have needed this if you diagnosed the cause of inflation correctly. You could have ended maybe around here. I, I still think rates should have gone up, but did they need to go up to where they are? So this is where we enter the year. You heard Powell talk last week, no doubt, about the, he expects to lower interest rates a couple of times at least this year. From my personal point of view, my wife works at the Federal Reserve Board, so I have to choose my words really carefully here. I, they, they, their models are showing that they should already have lowered interest rates. Okay? They, they know that they're kind of like over the cliff, so to speak. It's like, we're, we, we, we should be lowering interest rates. We know we should be lowering interest rates, but it looks kind of silly if we start lowering interest rates at the present time. So there's a lot of... Well, I don't know what the word is, but we're trying, to protect, we're trying to direct your attention to other things. Please, don't pay attention to us at the moment. The, the internal models of the Federal Reserve Board show that right now we should probably be about half a point down from where we are, <clears throat> and if not three quarters of a point. They're promising three quarters of a point by the end of the year. So uh, they will gradually catch up where, where they think they should be, but it's going to have to be done in a politically correct way. Lowering interest rates in an election year is not very popular with the other party, the out party. Now, this is an awful chart to try to describe. You all know this, so I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. If I lend you money overnight, you pay me back tomorrow morning, there's not much risk, so I price the interest rate low. If I lend you money for 10 years, a lot could happen in 10 years, so I price the interest rate high. The higher on this, this is a line showing the difference between this short-term rate and that long-term rate. That difference, that thing we all call the yield curve, right? This, you could go one, two, three years and plot it up. You get the yield curve, right? <coughs> this, when it's below zero, the exact opposite's happened. I'm lending you money short-term, but I'm really worried about what's happening in the short-term. So I'm going to price the interest, I'm going to price the rent money high. But I, if three years, four years from now, I think everything's going to settle down so I can price the, that money low. So now you get, instead of having a yield curve from your point of view going like this, you have a yield curve going like this. It's negative. That's when it gets below zero. That's the gap between overnight and, and 10 years. Every time this happens, we've had a recession. Okay? Now... Here we are. As we go into this year, this is telling you, this is the, all the wise folks in the, who move lots of money around overnight and stuff, telling you that we are expecting a recession this year. That's what that's telling you. All right? Whether you believe it or not, I'm just letting you know, every time it's been below zero, going back, and it goes back a long way, we've had either a very significant sh uh, uh, slowdown or we've had a recession. So that's another thing to put in your back pocket as you think and talk to all of your friends about the economy this year. The money markets are telling you that we've got an issue. Now, it could simply be that they're panicking because of something, inflation or whatever, but they panicked about stuff before. And this was, you know, all I can say is every time 
it looks like they, were, they got it right. So, if you were, if you were a um, betting person, and this is your particular favorite statistic, you're, you're assuming a recession sometime, which is not good news for Mr. Biden. This is the federal deficit. It's going the wrong way, some of you would say. Um, starts back here in 1980. Reagan creates this. Then Clinton gets this back out. Clinton, then Bush comes in and says, oh, look, we're above zero. So this is a, a government surplus. Can you imagine that? A federal surplus. That seems like a, a lifetime ago. Um, we're taking in too much money from the taxpayers, so we're going to give some money back to you. It's your money after all. We don't need it because we, we, we're at zero. The problem is he took too much back, got us back into deficit. Then we had a recession, which didn't, make it, didn't help his case. I, I give him credit. <laughs> we had a recession, if you remember, in 2001. It didn't help him. Then we come down. This, this, is, this is created by the Great Crash. We start, this is Obama's austerity program trying to get us back. That's exactly the wrong thing to do, as I just told you, if we want to get back to potential GDP, but that's another question altogether. Then, then boom, now we're going back here. So that, I put the trend line there. The big discussion this year, both political parties, they're talking about how you close the deficit. Do we need to, if I'm in, if I'm in one of my more radical moments? No, we don't. But everyone seems to think it's a big deal. So both political parties are saying we need to close this, uh, reduce the deficit. I'm someone that says the amount of debt we have is manageable if the economy is growing. I would prefer us to look at growing the economy more rapidly because there's a denominator, you, you, you know, right? The, the, the debt is only a problem if you can't pay it. And the way you pay it is to have a growing economy that generates incomes that I can then allocate to the debt. <clears throat> but there you go. We, I've, got, I've got at the end of this, I told you I'm going to show you plans. There are radical differences. I've got three plans that I'm going to show you. Radical differences in each of those. Biden is trying to reduce this through a combination of tax increases and um, uh, uh, spending. He's got both spending increases and tax increases. So it's a bit of a centrist kind of plan. Trump, I've had a hard time, to be perfectly honest, deciding exactly what he's talking about. But I have read enough of what he's been saying that I think he's, I'll show you in a minute, his policies are going to add to this, not detract it. The Republican Party came out, the Republican Party, something called the Republican Study uh, Committee. Uh, last Thursday came out with a 150 page, you're laughing at me because I was talking about it this morning. I was, you know, I was moaning about it because I actually read the darn thing last Thursday. In fact, they came out last Thursday. I've got this presentation done. They could have come out a month ago. It would have been, would have been helpful. Um, <clears throat> 150 pages long, so I went through the whole darn thing. I think that they have got, they claim to be able to get us to zero. And I will leave it to you when we get to it to see if you think that's credible or not. Unemployment rate. Again, come back to that. Do you remember that GDP potential didn't get? The reason that is so slow is because we didn't stimulate the economy. We, right? It took us a long time to get back down to this kind of level of unemployment. Biden was determined not to do that. Huge stimulus. Boom! Right back. That was why we did it. Boom! Right back. And we're now at levels of unemployment we haven't seen for a very long time. That's precisely why he did it, because he learned from that. And the, I know some of the people who are his, act as his advisors, and you, would t you talk to them, I don't want to repeat that mistake. So they, they took a chance here. Did they take too much chance? I think that's a good quite discussion to have. Okay. Now, most of you probably don't realize how these numbers come about. So I decided to tell you. There's two ways of determining unemployment. Or, uh, sorry, there are two ways of determining the number of employed people in this country. There's what's called the household survey and what is called the establishment survey. The establishment survey, when you read in the newspapers that the United States added 200,000 jobs last month, it's coming from this. 
called the Establishment Survey. What is that? The government asks companies how many people did you hire, more people did you hire. It's why it's called the Establishment. I'm, as I'm asking businesses how many more people did you add to payroll last month, right? That's called the Establishment Survey. That's how we determine how many jobs were added. This is the Household Survey. That's where we get the unemployment rate from. They don't come from the same place. What is the Household Survey? What it says. I call up people around the country. Are you employed? Yes or no? If no, do you want to be employed? Yes. Oh, you're unemployed. Okay? If you're not employed and you don't want to be employed, you're not in the workforce. Okay? That's how we calculate the unemployment rate. They come from different places. That's why periodically you can read that we had an increase in jobs, but an increase in unemployment too. Because you're going to different data sources to get, to get what, what the average person thinks it's come from the same place. It's not. All right, so you, sometimes you can read, in, read the numbers and you say, oh, there are more jobs. That must mean unemployment's gone down. No, that doesn't mean that at all. Right? So you have to know where they're coming from. The reason that's important is because if you look over the last 12 months, the household survey says we've added 2.7 million jobs. But the establishment survey says we've added only 0.7 million jobs. Now, if you're the Federal Reserve Board and you're thinking, I need to have a little bit of unemployment to lower, to, to lower inflation, which one of these do you believe? It's a tough one. That's why I'm, I've been emphasizing this throughout, throughout the, the talk. It's like there's so many contradictory things going on in the data, it's hard to unpack what's actually going on. People are obviously telling us that, that they've got new jobs. But if they've got new jobs, why aren't, why aren't the companies telling us that their payrolls have gone up? It's a very weird world we're living in. These two numbers are usually much closer together. This is another example of how the data is just not helping us trying to unpack what's going on in this election year. <clears throat> another way of looking at it would be this. This is hours worked, changed from the previous year. Right? If you're hiring a whole bunch more people, there should be more hours worked, unless they're all sitting not doing anything. Right? Right? So it's like you should, but it's virtually zero. So what are these people all doing? It's, it's like, it's, it's a very weird, I mean, you read these numbers and you say, well, I saw the higher number last week, so this week I should see this going up, and it doesn't go up. You, you spend the next week trying to figure out what's going on. Nobody knows what's going on. It's a very strange year. 2024, we've got an election in the middle of it, and this data is so muddled, you can pretty much say anything you like, I think and you'd be half true. I mean, it's, like it's one of those moments where the data is it's not clear. I can't attack my opponent for not generating jobs. Which data set am I using? He could be using this one, and I'm using that one. We're both right. OK, that's not helpful. Oh, no, I did it again. I apologize, people. I am, I'm not used to this thing. There you go. <clears throat> OK, now, another thing you're going to hear this election year Biden saying he's created a lot of manufacturing jobs. All right? Okay. That's not necessarily a good thing because we want fewer manager, manufacturing jobs, but we're still manufacturing a lot of stuff. Why is that? Everyone in the audience say that's because if productivity's gone up, and if productivity goes up, wealth goes up. Good. You all gave me the right answer. So we, we don't want to get a lot of unproductive manufacturing jobs. Okay? So that you have to know whether they're productive or not. Nonetheless, we're in a year when we need to generate manufacturing jobs that's making us feel good. If you go back to all the post-war recessions and then go to the start of that recession, and I've, we've arbitrarily here taken four years because we're four years after the start of the last recession, and then you say, how many job, manufacturing jobs did I add in those four years? Only in three instances did we actually add manufacturing jobs? That's 69, this cycle, and 60. All the rest, all these other recessions, four years later, we either, we had, we're still shedding manufacturing jobs. That's what makes this year very, very weird. Biden is going to say, this is a triumph, this is the cycle. Right? We've brought a lot of these, uh, he, you know, he's going to be running, you're going to see him running around places like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and, and so on. So, yes, I brought manufacturing jobs back. We just have to ask whether they're the right jobs to have. Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe not. So, but we love manufacturing in this country. So, 
just another thing to add into your thought process as we go through the year. This, this is actually an aberration. Look at the... We, we, the United States has been shedding manufacturing jobs since about 1950s. There are much, much fewer, far fewer people in manufacturing than there were but way back then. And that's a good thing because we have robots doing the work and that generates, generates profits, right? That's a good thing. It generates wages, theoretically. Net exports. Now, for the eagle-eyed of you, that looks a lot like the federal deficit. There's a reason for that. They are intimately associated with each other. <clears throat> Again, the United States used not to have, look, 47 through about 80, then it starts going wobbly on us, right? Used to have, trade was never a big thing in the United States economy. The United States was not a big trading nation. Then all of a sudden, da -da -da -da, boink, right? And this was the reversal in the Great Recession, but now we're back. The United, this is the effect of globalization, obviously, right? And then you're going to hear a lot about trade in this election. Trump is all over tariffs. He's all about eliminating imports. He's all about that stuff. Biden is, if you, for the, those of you who are paying attention, did not reverse most of Trump's tariffs. Both, for those of you who were brought up in the era back here when the United States was a free trade nation, both our political parties have walked away from that. Trade is not a big, not a, 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 a what's the word? Good word for either of our political parties. It's a really odd circumstance. The United States is walking away from globalization and it's walking away from trade. So there's a bun fight this year between the two parties over who can restrain trade the most. And that's usually a question about tariffs. And Trump is very, very aggressive, as you heard him, talking about tariffs. That's one of his big things. 10% tariff right across the board. And it, he focuses endlessly on China. That's why I did this. Sorry about the confusion. These are the countries. This is the imports into the United States. That's the exports to that country. This is the net balance. So $536 billion imports from China. 150 exports. This is 22 because we haven't completed the 23 data. Here we go. Now, that's everybody's obsessing over China. China, 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 right? If you think about trade, tariffs on China, tar China, China's doing all this to the United States. But look at the next countries, Mexico and Canada, right? Mexico and Canada, why is that? If you're a blue-collar worker in, oh, I don't know, Pennsylvania or Wisconsin, NAFTA, NAFTA, right? This is me exporting parts to Mexico for a car, this is me importing the car from Mexico, right? And where's the value added? In Mexico, not in the United States, right? That's the difference in trade here. So you've got to be careful. Why aren't we slamming tariffs on these people? Well, because Ford is responsible for most of this. You know, Ford and all the heavy machinery makers who've moved the production to either Canada or Mexico, they ship parts out, and the, the, ob the, the most obvious place is in Detroit. They ship it like 10 miles into Canada, have a factory in Canada, and they ship it back. Right? The parts go this way, the car comes this way. So you're going to hear a lot about trade, and they're focusing on this. A lot of the union members focus on this, because those union jobs to manufacture, assemble the car went in one of these directions, right? So a lot of that trade there is kind of like, is that really trade? It's not consumers buying new stuff from abroad. It's Ford. It's on the books of Ford. It's on the books of whomever. If you get into a big trade war, slapping on, slapping on tariffs all over the other place, as, as looks like there's going to be a discussion this year, I would suggest you take a look at this one. It's bigger than that one. The United States imports more from the EU than it does from China. If you want a trade war, go to war with Europe, right? The problem is we also export more. So if you get into a tariff war with, with the EU, you're going to lose a lot. You could potentially lose a lot of jobs in the United States. That's why this is probably not something that should be on the agenda, but is on the agenda. I was just saying everyone's proud of bringing production back and bringing the jobs home, made in America again and all that. But we live in a global world nowadays with this kind of a trade flow. This 
if you if if you get into and it, it did happen with the uh, steel tariffs that um, that you remember remember uh, Trump put on there was a tit for tat with Europe and everybody got hurt nobody really benefited at all it's just not very productive um, it, if those of you with a good memory can remember how Ch Japan was the big trade threat and look how insignificant it is now it's been totally dwarfed by these other trade blocks this is the creation of NAFTA. That's the rise of China. This is the unification uh, in trade policies in, in Europe. It's a different world, <clears throat> but you're going to see a lot of discussion about tariffs this year. I, I, I dug out from these folks. This is the impact of Trump's round of tariffs. Virtually nothing. We, we generated $74 million of tariff revenues to the government. That's tax. It's a ta tariff is a tax, so it's a tax income. Slowed down the growth, slowed down wages, lost a few jobs. In retaliation, those nasty people did some stuff to us. That had an impact, had an impact. It's negligible. In an economy that's like $21 trillion, this is meaningless. Why are we doing it? It's kind of, but it's, it's somehow psychologically important to, to not to have those deficits. Stock market, I'm getting towards the... You know, I, I pay no attention to the stock market. I'm going to be quite uh, open with you. But clearly the stock market loves Biden because it's through the roof, right? The, 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 the people who worry about these things are voting with their feet. Um, it was pretty, Trump loves to talk about this. It was good. Then you have the uh, uh, pandemic. Whoa, whoa. So, yes. But... If you take the last couple of years, which is what I've done here, and you look at the S&P, then you plot the tech stocks and you plot everything else. There's a bubble. There's a bubble brewing. Be careful, right? This sounds, to me, it feels a lot like the dot-com all over again. <clears throat> There's a lot of activity around AI. There's a lot of activity around, look at NVIDIA. NVIDIA's, NVIDIA, if the, the stock price of NVIDIA is now so high that if you wanted to buy one share using the dividends they give you, it would take 4,500 years. It's just absurd valuations flying around all over the place, right? We are in a strange place. And that's, there is a risk this year that we may start to see this unwind. So all I'm saying is, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm just saying, the stock market loves what's going on, but it may not love what's going on three months from now. All right, now let's get to the plans. All right, so Trump, trade increase, well, I just said, right? Eliminate import, but he hasn't actually defined what this is, so I had a hard time, to, 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 I have a hard time describing it to you, because he hasn't, that, they haven't described to anybody yet, but he's talking about it. <coughs> Make, make his own tax cuts permanent. Why does he need to do that? For those of you who need to understand this kind of stuff, when you pass tax cuts, you mustn't have a budget impact. There's kind of rules, right? So what you do is you go to the, CB, the Congressional Budget Office and say, I'm cutting taxes, and I know that's going to be a big deal for the deficit, but there's a sunset law, which means they're going to come off the books. And they come off the books, this set of tax cuts comes off the books in the, at the end of 2025. If they come off the books, the CBO says, oh, then it doesn't count. You may have made the deficit worse, but it's all going away. So there you go. So we don't worry about it. He wants to make them permanent. And I'll show you the impact of that in a minute. This is an interesting one. Energy. We're going to lower energy costs by making a uh, United States energy independent. News flash. The United States is energy independent. Um, we're, the United States is one of the, if not the world's largest oil producer, it already is. It's an exporter of natural gas. It doesn't need to import a thing. <coughs> Point number two, it already is in the Asian independent. The other thing that politicians always get uh, uh, muddled, oil, these things are priced on world markets. They have no control of them. You can produce all the oil you want in the United States. It's going to be priced by what people around the world want to pay for it. So your consumer is going to pay that price. The only problem with this from a, from a wealth generation point of view is that 
producing oil in the United States tends to be more expensive than producing oil in the Middle East. If you wanted to have the most efficient answer, you would import your oil from Saudi Arabia, but then you have to persuade them to dig it out the ground. They like not to do that because that keeps prices high. So our politicians need to understand supply and demand a little better, but they, they, I don't think they're ever going to. All right. Then, of course, because you just want to do stuff, you're going to, re you're going to reverse the green energy stuff. Uh, we're trying to make us independent on energy, but we're going to cut back on our energy production. Okay, that makes sense. <clears throat> the other thing to, for everyone to bear in mind is the United States now has more jobs in green energy than it does in old-fashioned energy, a lot more. Okay, so if you want to subsidize one of those two, you want to subsidize the place where you're generating jobs, not the place where you're losing jobs. Biden, his list is longer because he's just, he, everything gets, okay, maintain selective tariffs, target industries. You will read people saying, oh, that's the government, you know, backing and trying to take bets on industries. No, it's not. I don't, the last I saw, semiconductors was not a, a startup industry that may go out of business. It's a well-established business. We're actually putting money into well-established businesses. This is not the government taking bets. Right? This is not Solyndra. You remember that one? You remember, remember that? You know, they always get criticized. For, we put money into a company that went belly up. The government's backing the wrong things. This is not that. All right? um, tax increases on top owners and subsidy of capital gains, that, that is a good thing. Make taxes on work and capital gains the same. We're supposed to be a country that encourages work. <laughs> so make them the same. <clears throat> Um, extend payroll tax. Oh, you'll notice here, there's nothing about Social Security. It's a policy by abstentia. The, 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 and I, 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 got, I, I was reading, the, as I said, the other piece from, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, the Republican effort right now seems to be to kind of ignore it a little bit, knowing that it's going to go off track in 2035. You've probably all read about this. The fund that exists goes out of business in 25, 35. If that happens, Social Security payments automatically get reduced by about 25%. Okay? Right? That's just automatic. It's built in. So if you ignore the problem, ignore the problem, ignore the problem, because there's going to be a dire emergency, you're more likely to get what you want. It's like funding the government. We go through this crisis every week, apparently. We're do going to do the same here. Biden, goodness knows, is trying to head that off by increasing payroll taxes. He wants to raise corporate tax rate. This, I think, is just, that you can see some of this is never going to happen. He wants to extend ACA, <coughs> enterprise billing. These are all subs, as you can imagine, to, to the left. Child care, I think, is a big deal. The United States does not spend on child care. Um, I, I once looked this up. If you go to some European countries, the average per child is something in the order of fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. In the United States, it's about three. In the United States, does not spend on childcare, and yet we all know that children who go through that at an early age tend to be better workers, more productive workers, less likely to be in crime, and so on. So it's a good social investment, but we don't do it because it costs money. Minimum wage, I think that's kind of largely redundant, simply because wages are strong because we've got low unemployment. How does this all shape up in numbers? There you go. This is best I can do. This is extending his taxes. This is getting rid of the IRA, the legislation, the green stuff. This is repealing ACA. Don't forget he came into power in 2016, 17, promising to repeal, uh, repeal ACA that's still on his agenda. All right? <clears throat> These are the impacts, net, net, if I just go through my, um, extending the tax cut cost is about four and, and three quarter trillion. Uh, the IRA repeal will cost us about 376 billion. The ACA repeal will uh, cost us about 292. Why? Because both of those two had hidden tax increases in. If you repeal a legislation, you give up those tax increases, revenues go down. So the total impact on your deficit over the next 10 years is something in the order of five and a, and a third trillion. All right, increasing the deficit. I have yet to find, I've looked, anything in Trump says that's not, the, the, we're going to reduce the deficit. This, however, is the, these guys, Republican Study Committee. They, and this is the thing that came out last week. 
<coughs> what they've done is to say, okay, the government spending consists of two big buckets, mandatory, discretionary, mandatory is things like Medicare, Social Security. Uh, discretionary is things like defense and Justice Department, the EPA, whatever, whatever, right? So, the, uh, and this is the deficit that is created by deducting these. They're holding mandatory spending flat, despite the fact we've got a very rapidly aging and, and increasing number of uh, uh, people pulling down Social Security and so forth. Why can they do that? Well, because they're going to cut 50% out of Medicaid. They're going to redo Medicare and turn it, ironically, into an Obamacare, uh, uh, which is kind of odd because they then say they're going to repeal Obamacare. But the, 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 the basic point is what they're going to do is to abolish Medicare as it now exists and then reinvent it as a voucher system so you can go onto the market and buy your own insurance, but you would get a subsidy. All right? <clears throat> okay? And, and, and the, the, the reason for that is because we're setting you free from the government. So you're, you should be happy about that. The problem with that is that Medicare has been successful in keeping down costs. ACA wasn't. That's ironically the Republican criticism of ACA. So if you're turning the whole of Medicare into the ACA, you're actually increasing costs. It's, a, it's, it's an odd thing, but there you go. I can't argue with it. It's in black and white in there, the material. They're going to eliminate ACA. That will, that will help everyone. Raise the retirement age in, in Social Security. This is something you're going to hear a lot this year. It's a problem. And it's a problem because everyone says we're all living longer. But not everyone is living longer. Blue-collar workers are not living longer. White-collar workers are living longer. So, so, right, there's a big difference on which, who you are in society. So if you, cut, if, raise the, uh, uh, if you raise the retirement age, you're hurting a lot of low-income people because they're not going to be able to pull down as much uh, uh, Social Security as they used to be able to. It's, uh, it, people don't think about that because we all say we're living longer, but it's not true. Not everyone. It's, that's an average. And within the average, you've got to understand who you're talking about. Okay? So there's always on the left... You're going to hear, that's a terrible thing to do because, you know, hurting the workers. On the right, oh, on the average, we're all living longer. So it depends on how you choose your numbers. Now, down here, how do we get discretionary spending down? Well, this is, this is look, 6% down to 4%. It's a big, huge cut. This is a big, huge cut. Well, I went through their material, and every other paragraph was this one. We're going to get rid of all of the various departments anywhere in the federal government that has the word gender in it. All right? So it seems to be quite, quite a common thing. And the unfortunate part about this is a lot of, a lot of departments have a de, you know, gender and inclusive department. Helps in hiring, helps in managing human resources. They're all going to get wiped out. All right? Uh, we're going to cut arts and uh, education funding because we don't need that. The... Um, for those of you, and I mentioned it this morning, the Kennedy, Cent uh, is it, yeah, Kennedy Center, that's getting zero in future. The public broadcast, these are all sh the things that the Republicans have wanted to cut for a very long time. Public radio, public broadcasting, all those things. Why? Read the material. It's all about woke. These are centers of wokeism and we're opposed to wokeism, so we're not going to fund them. And besides which, we shouldn't be doing it because we're the government. Eliminate climate change, uh, cut, eliminate climate change research. There is an organization called the National, I think, what's it called? The Oceanographic uh, Agency. They want to eliminate that completely, just eliminate it. Um, they want to defund all sorts of bits and pieces. You know, if you're going to have this kind of a cut, you can't just limit. You've actually got to cut. You've got to cut things out altogether. And we're going to cut stuffing in the federal government. For those of you who uh, like to keep score on these things, um, the, the, we have the same number of federal employees as we did 50 years ago. Everybody thinks it's gone up. It hasn't. Government hiring has gone up at the state level, not at the federal level. <laughs> That's where the big bulge is. And the irony of one of the tricks they're playing here, they're taking all, for instance, infrastructure, road, out of the federal budget, and they're giving it to states. So states are actually going to have to hire people in order to handle that. So it's going off the federal budget, but it's going into some other budget, but that's not our issue. Okay? GDP, and they're assuming, in order to make all this work, and end up with a zero here, 
you have to have these rates, which we haven't seen for a long time. Okay? This, <laughs> this is the Biden plan. Try not to focus too much on it. He's saying, whoa! There's just lines and lines of stuff. I'm, I, let me summarize it for you. We're going to increase spending on all these things up here uh, by three and a quarter trillion. We're going to raise taxes and do all sorts of stuff. We're also going to cut some spending here. That'll be that. So the net impact is that we're going to reduce the deficit by about three. This has no chance of getting into, into being because the Democrats don't control the House. So whatever. But it's an interesting exercise nonetheless. Okay? Now, I promised you I'm going to tease you right at the end. We're at the end. Institute for Select. Does anyone know what this organization is? It's a really important organization. These are the supply managers in various businesses around the country. They have a little club called the Institute for Supply Management. Every, year, every month, these people produce numbers, which everybody pays attention to because it's the manufacturing sector, right? They do this. They have an index. They tell you which direction the numbers are going, the rate of change, and the trend. Now, we're talking about 24 now. So, a number below 50 means a contracting economy. That's the number, you may see it, purchasing managers index. You may see it announced in the press. It was at 47.8 in February. It's contracting, it's contracting faster, and it's going down for 16. They're telling you that the manufacturing sector is slowing down. New orders. It's interesting thing here is it switched from growing to contracting. Same thing with production. Employment, contracting faster. It's been going for five months. In prices, oh, that's good. We're increasing prices, so don't worry about that. We're, we're all good. The economy may be going to hell in a handbasket, but we're increasing prices. That's good. Order backlog. It's trend for 17 months. It's slowing. The decrease is slowing down, but nonetheless, overall economy growing 46 months, but the manufacturing sector slowing down. This is one of the most watched indices that comes out every, and it's telling us the economy is slowing down. Now, I'm going to really teach you. The Fed, as you all know, because you're super educated, consists of 12 districts. It's not just one organization. There are 12 of them. The only one, I'm told, that matters is the New York Fed. All the others have to find a job for themselves to do. The Atlanta Fed, God bless them, has come up with this interesting little nifty thing. What they do is they say, as all this data floods out, we don't want to wait three months to see what GTB did back then. We're going to tell you what it's doing now, judging on our experience and the flood of information coming out. So, here they go. They say, here's the date, here's the release. And back in January, they had two data items. The third quarter last year, fourth quarter last year. If we had stuck at the fourth quarter, they said GDP in the first quarter would be growing 4.9. But now, the fourth quarter is slowing down. So we're growing at 3.2. That's what they're telling us. Then they go home, have a cup of coffee, come back the next day, say, no, we were wrong. We've got no more data, but we thought about it again. It's actually three. They, this stuff gets into the press. This is why you see you know, the media talking about what's going on. Okay? A few days later, that manufacturing index that I just described to you, that comes out. Oh, that was a good one. The January one was a good one. We go up. International trade, near, not so good. Wholesale trade, not so good. So we're pulling... The, oh, wait a minute. In the middle of February, now we're down again. Retail trade numbers, the import prices, industrial production. Yeah, that 3.4 doesn't look good. The first quarter is now at 3... Uh, sorry, 2.9. 2 2.9 2 because the housing starts. We keep it steady. Oh, we go back up. New home sales are strong. So we're back up at 3. Just, this is just in one month, we're all over the place, right? <clears throat> then you get some stuff from the census. But that doesn't change us. We're not... Uh, but the personal incomes, and that, this nipper is uh, the income accounts that the government produces. We go down to three. And then, you remember that, uh, in, that supply one I just showed you? That comes out. Boom! That's a bad one. The, the, the first quarter's not going at three. It's going... In one month, these, these great people have gone from that to that. Just based upon the flow of data. So... I'm not actually going to tell you how the year's going to go because it's like crazy. <laughs> In one month, you can do that. But you can see the problem people are having understanding 24. One last thing. I have to do this because Claudia Sam 
she got, didn't get booted out of the Fed, but she was unpopular at the Fed because she came up with this rule that told them when they should be raising and lowering interest rates, and it's a really good rule. Everybody talks about it. The Fed now even publishes it, which is kind of a turn of events, but she had to leave. She now runs her own company. If you ever get there, above that line, this, this blue line goes above that, it's a rock-solid predictor of uh, a recession. Okay? And we're going in the wrong direction. We're going in the wrong direction. So my, my you know, all through this talk, I've said, eh, things are not, things are softening, things are going down. Things are, 24, we're all saying, well, it could be good for Biden because the Biden economy has been good. But by the end of 24, it may not be so good. So this is, this is something we should all be worried about. Or he should be. I, I'm not. I'm just watching. Let me remind you how I started that. Where you have a great economy, really good. People just don't want to see it. GDP slowing down, inflation down but not out, interest rates down. You heard it from Powell, so that's nothing coming from me. Deficit will increase, I almost guarantee you, because nobody's really going to do anything about it, because there's going to be a divided government. Whoever wins the White House, probably not going to win both the House and the Senate. So nothing's going to happen. <clears throat> Unemployment, I think, will rise. That means wages will probably be stagnant. We're going to have a lower trade deficit. Why? Because... The economy slowing down. That means we're not pulling, buying stuff from abroad. That will naturally slow the deficit down, which is not going to stop everyone wanting to slap tariffs on it. But nonetheless, there you go. Stock market, I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. <coughs> That's it, guys. <laughs> Tell me how I'm wrong. Please. Yeah, go. So, Peter, when are the pundits going to start talking about what the Republicans are going to do if it was on your sheet of your graph? When they've read it. <laughs> I mean, there are two major right of center documents floating around out there at the moment. And I have read them both, and I think I took many years off my life by reading them both, not because of what they contain, but just they're so damn long. The Heritage Foundation published a, an 800-page document. The, I, the forward to which is about 8,000 words, and the forward is worth reading because it really gives you an idea. But that's not a budget document. It's a social policy, cultural more of a document. It's all about um, 14th Amendment, abortion, and things like that. So that, that's, that's the Heritage Foundation. The one I was referring to is this uh, um, Republican uh, committee, which started its life out as a fairly far-right group, but is now, this is why I included it, represented. There's 170 members of their caucus that have signed on to that plan, right? And it includes everything I was just talking about, major cuts in in Medicare, the ab abolition of ACA. So that goes to show you where their head's at, right? That thing came out last Thursday. So it should be digested by the media sometime in the next few days, I would imagine. You might, might see it. The problem is, it's not a Trump document. So they're not going to talk about it, <laughs> right? The way that I look at it is that it's an opening bid in a conversation between them and Trump, right? They're basically saying, here's a lot of stuff. You, you, you're going to be the president, right? We want you to be the president. This is what we want you to do. And he's going to cherry pick and he's going to cut deals and there's going to be a lot of discussion. As the year goes on, it may not get a lot of discussion because I don't think they're going to put it, the Republicans themselves are not necessarily going to talk about it too much. It's the punditry might, the punditry might, but I don't know. Yep. Thank you again, Peter. <laughs> You're welcome. If the economy is slowing down, yep. is now a good time to increase taxes on corporations and <laughs> Very good point. I'm glad you noticed that. No, <laughs> not necessarily. The question, the question is, do you think it is slowing down and by, by how much, right? The, if we're slowing down and you raise taxes on corporations, but at the same time you're doing some of those spending things, 
you're neutralizing the tax cut. You're basically saying, I'm stimulating a little bit here and I'm slowing down a little bit over here. Net, net, I'm hoping I'm not going to slow the whole thing down. If it was all tax increases and no spending, right, I would say, yes, it's, it's, it would slow the plane down. But, it's, but yes, it's a good point. Is it a good idea? I'm, I, I didn't write it. <laughs> um, I, I, the, 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 the oddity is that in most years, that Biden budget would be viewed as quite a centrist budget. It's a little bit of everything. It's, there's clearly things in there that he's willing to compromise on. There's tax increases I could do without. There's spending I could do without. You know, it's a come and talk to me document. But it's not going anywhere. So you need, it's an academic question whether it's going to slow the economy down because we'll never get there. What else, guys? We done? Yeah, go. Yeah, the 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 the, the unemployment rate. Is, it's really not the unemployment rate, it's the, the number of people in the workforce. There has been a steady reduction in white male employment going on now for more than a decade. This is not a new thing. So they're separating, they're giving up, they're going home, they're not, just not working. So that number has come down. Women have done the opposite, which has made up the difference. And if you look at minorities, they've also gone up. Um, it's, a, it's, an, it's, it's actually quite a severe problem because you need to have your maximum workforce out there and you've got a chunk of the workforce basically saying eh, not interested um, one of the reasons probably is to do with wages um, if you look back over the last 30 to 40 years that the, at the low end of the wage spectrum white male high school educated person and through till about 2018 2019 if, if someone going from the mid 70s had not seen a pay increase if you were just for inflation. You, you could work your entire life without a pay increase. No wonder they're a little upset. And they're, and they're finding other things to do uh, and not, not get involved in, in, in the workplace. So it's a, I think it's, it's one of those. You remember that line I had with the potential? If you want to be a potential, you need those guys in the workforce doing something, right? How you get them in the workforce, I'm very simple, pay them. Right? Give them a pay increase. But that's, you know, we've, we've also, one of the other things we've done is to make, we've increased the number of part-time workers and people who don't want to be part-time but are part-time. The other, in, the nasty thing that is most of us would miss, a lot of these people don't know week to week what their work week is going to look like. Right? They are given, you can come in, you know, your work week next week is 8 to whatever. Right? And then the next week it's 10 to whatever. It's very hard to organize a family life. It's hard to get kids in school. It's made, it, made life really difficult. All those people look employed, but they're not necessarily happily employed. So that's one other reason why you're seeing some of these sour sentiment numbers flowing through, particularly at the bottom end of the income spectrum. Yeah. Okay? I mean, it's, it's a big issue. It's a big issue. It's, it's a, and it's particularly important, in the, it stands out in the United States. The United States is an outlier in some of this stuff. It's real, we, we've really screwed up our wage rates, and it's showing in a lot of the employment numbers and, and so on. So, Guys, thank you very much.